Well, good morning and welcome uh, to our family service here at Deeside Christian Fellowship Church. Uh, and can I just extend a very warm welcome wherever you are. I know that um, many of you will be watching uh, the service online. And uh, I just uh, trust that you've had a really happy Christmas over the last uh, few days. Um, perhaps a little bit too much to eat. Um, maybe just that extra bit of turkey or maybe one or two mince pies, uh, too many. But uh, whatever you did, I hope, uh, I hope you've had a, a very happy time. Um, obviously, this Christmas has been very different from uh, the one that many of us had planned or were normally used to. Um, even just a, a few days before Christmas Day, the uh, restrictions changed uh, quite considerably, and so a lot of plans had to be altered. Um, many people weren't able to travel and uh, perhaps family members, friends weren't able to gather uh, as had been expected. So I know that there was a lot of disappointment in terms of uh, the plans that have been set in place. But despite all of that, um, I, I do trust that you had uh, a happy time um, on Christmas Day. And despite all of this current turmoil, um, Let's remember that our God is a faithful God um, and he is with us. And uh, let's remember the message that the angels delivered to the shepherds on that hillside as they watched their flocks. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a saviour who is Christ the Lord. And uh, that good news is as valid for us today as it was back then. Uh, and that message of great joy is as valid for us today as it was back then. So we do not need to be fearful because we have our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and he will never forsake us. Hallelujah. So before we... Um, begin the service, we're going to look at a short PowerPoint which is um, talking about our Christmas offering and the mission partners that uh, in various parts of the world are dealing with children's orphanages. So I would encourage you, if you're able, uh, to give generously to uh, our Christmas offering um, to help those mission partners in those parts of the world. Um, then we are going to sing our first song. His mercies are more, followed by the children's song, and I would encourage you to get up and follow the actions and, and sing along to the words at home. Uh, then uh, Lewis will bring our reading, uh, followed by uh, Rianne will be praying for our service. And then we're going to sing one more song, Ancient of Days, before uh, Andy Jack. Our care pastor will come and deliver the message. And Andy, uh, we're very much looking forward to uh, what God has laid on your heart. Uh, and the passage today that we're going to be looking at is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. So if you have a, a Bible with you, um, please follow along. But before we begin, let me just open our service in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just... Um, Thank you for your son, Jesus. And we just thank you that we can celebrate his birth this Christmas time, despite all of the turmoil. Help us to remember uh, that you love us and that we are not to be fearful uh, because of the good news of Jesus. Um, and that uh, that great joy we should celebrate, that you loved us so much that you sent your son to earth to be among us. And so, Lord, uh, we just pray for our service this morning. We pray for Andy uh, as he delivers the message. Uh, and we pray for each and every one of us in our respective homes. Just be with us, draw close to us, um, watch over us, Lord. And uh, we just ask that uh, you draw especially near to those that perhaps were disappointed that they couldn't have family or friends together. Uh, and perhaps are uh, feeling 
somewhat isolated or lonely at this time, we just uh, pray that you would draw especially close to them. Uh, we think of those members in the fellowship who are grieving the loss of loved ones, uh, and we just, we just pray for them too, Lord. Just be with them at this, at this time. It's especially hard at Christmas time. We think of those in the fellowship who are unwell as well, Lord, uh, and we just ask that you would uh, be with them and uh, strengthen them uh, in their suffering. So we just commit all of these things to you in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Amen. Amen.
today is from Philippians 3 verses 1 to 11. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. 
To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Let us pray. Father God, on this first Sunday after Christmas, we want to praise you and thank you for the wonderful gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, born of a virgin in Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago. Thank you that he lived a perfect life and died on the cross, a once and for all sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Thank you that he rose from the dead three days later and that this Christmas and every Christmas we can celebrate the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Father, this year has been a year like no other where we have seen countries across the world devastated by the coronavirus pandemic. Now, over Christmas, we have been told not to gather with our loved ones, not to travel to visit elderly relatives, not to celebrate with each other in our homes. There are those desperately in need of money and work, of companionship and hope. Lord, we lift up all those who are suffering right now, whether from sickness or bereavement, from loneliness, mental health issues, from unemployment and loss of livelihoods. Loving Father, you have promised that nothing will separate us from your love and that when we pass through the rivers they shall not overwhelm us, and when we walk through the fire we shall not be burned. Lord, help us to feel your love right now. Be our comfort at this time. Help us not to be afraid, but rather to trust in your power to save and your wisdom to guide. As we approach a new year, help us to rejoice in the hope that we have in Jesus. Help us to be thankful for all the blessings you reap on us each day and help us to trust completely in you. Almighty God, we know that everything is in your sovereign control. We pray that you will stay your hand on the spread of this virus and give wisdom to our governments as they seek to make the best decision for our nation. We pray for the countrywide vaccination programmes that will be offered in the new year that they will be carried out swiftly and efficiently and that they will be effective in the curbing of the further spread of the virus. Thank you for all those working in the hospitals and in the care homes and on the front line caring for those in need. We think of our mission partners around the world, Lord. Strengthen and encourage them too at this time. We pray for all our children and youths and we give thanks for the children and youth services that were held last week. We pray that all our children will come to know you as their Lord and Saviour. And Lord, we thank you for Andy as he comes to share the message you have laid on his heart. May we all hear you speaking through him today. We commit all these things to you in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Kingdoms rise and fall, there is 
Happy Christmas from me. I do hope you managed to have a good Christmas despite all the restrictions upon us. I hope too that you managed to get some meaningful time with family and loved ones and that you knew God's peace in what has been a very different Christmas for us all. Recent headlines sum it all up, don't they? Bleakest midwinter. Christmas cancelled for millions. Will this nightmare ever end? It is frustrating, isn't it? It's disappointing. It's it's worrying as we look forward. And it raises a huge question for us as we head towards the turn of a new year. How are we going to continue to navigate this as, as Christians? And this morning we're continuing our series in Philippians. And in God's goodness, he's given us a passage on this Sunday to help us. Chapter 3 of Philippians addresses two core issues for us as followers of Jesus. Number one is joy, and number two is steadfastness or, or standing firm. How are we going to keep rejoicing 
in the Lord. How are we going to stand firm as disciples of Jesus? It's a battle when so much threatens to steal our joy and so much threatens to knock us off course and cause us to drift from the Lord Jesus. Well, this passage, verses 1 to 11 of Philippians 3, addresses both of those core topics. And to see how it does that, we need to look at the bookends either side of our passage. So firstly, look with me at verse 1 of chapter 3, where Paul starts off by saying, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Now, that's been a recurring theme throughout this letter, hasn't it? And verses 2 and following, it seems, are going to show us how we can keep rejoicing in the Lord. So that's the first bookend. And the second one, you need to drop down to chapter 4. You see, the chapter divisions are, are not very helpful, often. They're not in the original um, New Testament documents that we have. They've been added for our convenience. But look at chapter 4, verse 1, where Paul is rounding off his argument. And he says, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord. And the therefore, at the beginning of verse 1, and the stand firm thus, stand firm like this, suggests that everything Paul has written beforehand in chapter 3 helps us to understand how we might stand firm. So, here's the question for us this morning. What does Paul think will help you and me to keep rejoicing and to keep standing firm in the coming year? Number one, he says, throw out all self-confidence. This whole section really is about confidence. What are we going to put our confidence in to get us right with God? When we think God is pleased with us, what are the reasons for why we think that? What are we trusting in for that? What are we putting our confidence in, asks Paul. And in these verses, Paul is urging us to stop putting confidence in, in self and anything that you or I might seek to contribute to our right standing with God. The language of verses 1 to 6 is quite technical, but those verses are all pushing us forward towards verse 7. I want us to start there. Verse 7, Paul says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss, for the sake of Christ. Interesting. Here is Paul doing an accounting exercise. It's the language in verse 7 of an audit. It's as if Paul has two columns. On the one side, he's got his profit column, things that contribute towards a right standing with God, things that God would be impressed with. And then over here on the other side, you've got the loss column, things that don't help his standing with God. And verse 7 describes the change in Paul's value system since he became a Christian, since he became a follower of Jesus. Before that moment, in his prophet column, Paul says he had loads of stuff that he had done that he thought would put him in God's good books. Look at the end of verse 4. He says there, if anyone else thinks he has reasons for confidence in the flesh, confidence because of what they have been doing in and through themselves in their strength, he says, well, I have more. OK, Paul, well, what's in your profit column? What was in your profit column? OK, four, four Ps for us. The first one is pedigree. Verse 5. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Pedigree. You see, the Old Testament law, God's law, said you had to be circumcised on the eighth day. Paul says, I have been. He'd also come from the right people. Israel, God's chosen people. Not only that, he'd come from the right tribe, he says, the tribe of Benjamin. 
You see, Benjamin was the one tribe that remained loyal to the kingly tribe of Judah. And he sums up his pedigree by saying, me, well, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. When it comes to pedigree, there it is in the prophet column. Second P, end of verse 5, performance. What does Paul say there? He says, as to the law, I'm a Pharisee. The Pharisees were the most meticulous, the most rigorous, the most zealous of all of the Jews. That's me, says Paul. That's my performance. Prophet. Third P was his passion. Verse 6. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. You see, Paul was so concerned for the cause of God that actually he, he'd gone out on a religious war against all of those people who had decided to follow Jesus, those people who called themselves Christians. So again, in the prophet column, we have passion. Final P, Paul's purity. End of verse 6. As to righteousness under the law, end of verse 5, sorry, blameless. And you get to that point and you have to admit, it's pretty impressive, isn't it? Prophet, 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 prophet. And then, look what Paul says, verse 7. Look how Paul views all, all of that, all of that stuff in the prophet column, now that he's become a Christian, a follower of Jesus. Verse 7, but whatever gain I had or profit I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Now that word loss is significant. It comes from the world of shipping. It's a word used for when your cargo slipped to the back of the boat and plunged to the bottom of the sea. Loss. Paul goes even further than that. Verse 8. Indeed, he says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Everything that was gain, he now considers loss when it comes to getting right with God. And then finally, his, clim his climactic statement at the end of verse 8. For his sake, that's Jesus, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Rubbish. You know, in the original Greek language, that word simply meant waste, garbage, manure, even excrement. Can you see what Paul is saying? When it comes to confidence, when it comes to getting right with God, he says all of his amazing credentials, his religious observance, his performance, you put it all together and really it's just like a bag of excrement. Lots. And he's saying that that is how you and I, that is how we are to view these things too. He says, throw out all self-confidence. And instead, this is a positive flip side of the coin, trust in Jesus alone. Let's read on, end of verse 8 and verse 9. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ, verse 9, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Now, Paul is talking there a lot about righteousness. And that word is taken from the law courts. To be righteous is to stand on those steps outside the courtroom after a trial and to declare, I have been acquitted. I have been justified. I have found to be in the right. And here Paul is talking about being made right, being in the right before God. And he says two really important things about that righteousness, that standing before God. End of verse 9, 
He calls it the righteousness from God. It comes from God. And of course, it has to. We've just seen we don't have any righteousness of our own. Everything that we might have thought we could contribute has been counted as rubbish. It's changed columns from profit to loss. No, this right, righteous standing before God, Paul says, is a gift from God. It's a declaration that God makes on my life and yours. It's a wonderful thing. To be declared right with God is to have God's future verdict on our lives announced today. How? Well, the second most important statement Paul makes, verse 9 and 10, not only is this righteousness from God, he says it comes through faith in Christ. Do you see it? Towards the end of verse 9, a righteousness of my own, not that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And the idea of faith is the same idea as putting your confidence in something or someone. Here's the idea. As I put my confidence, my faith, in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, an amazing transaction takes place. On the one hand, the punishment for everything I have done wrong has been paid by Jesus on that cross. And on the other hand, the perfect record of his beautiful, spotless, blameless life is then credited to me. This is so important. Let me say that again. The punishment for everything that I have done wrong is paid for by Jesus on the cross. And that perfect record of Jesus' spotless, pure, beautiful life is then credited to me. That transaction happens the moment I put my faith, my confidence in what Jesus has done for me on that cross. I love watching legal dramas and sometimes you get that moment, don't you, where people do come outside the courtroom and they stand on those steps and there's that tremendous look of relief on their faces. They've been acquitted. The champagne bottles are open. The celebrations begin. And Paul is saying that can be our experience with God. Once we are considered righteous by God, what a relief. No more fear of God. We can approach God boldly. We don't need to fear now the verdict of God on the final day, on that judgment day. No, no. He's given us that verdict ahead of time now because of our confidence in Jesus. And it also means we can face death, therefore, with utter confidence. So Paul is inviting his readers here in chapter 3 to take a personal confidence check. When it comes to our standing before God, your standing before God, what are you trusting today? What is your confidence in? Is it in what Jesus has done for you? Or is it in what you are might be trying to do for him? It's such an easy trap to fall into because by nature we are all innately proud people. We all want to contribute something towards a right standing with God. And we start putting confidence in our, in our daily devotions maybe as Christians, in our service in the life of the church, maybe in our position in the leadership of the church. It may be in our personal holiness and we feel we're doing well and we start ticking those boxes in the profit column. Profit. Profit. Now they are all good things, but Paul has just been saying they are rubbish when it comes to putting us right with God. Two things happen when we start to trust what we do, put, put in confidence in the flesh. On the one hand, we start to feel wobbly. Oh no, I, I haven't ticked all the boxes this week. Uh, what does God think of me now? We become wobbly in our faith. And secondly, of course, if that happens, we start to lose our joy. These two big themes that Paul is addressing. 
how to keep rejoicing and how to keep standing firm. Having our confidence in the right place is so crucial. And because it's so crucial, that is why Paul's language is so strong in the opening verses of chapter 3. So strong towards anyone who encourages us to prize anything other than Jesus, or put our confidence in anything other than Jesus. You see, in those opening verses, Paul is describing a very dangerous group of people. Jewish teachers who told Gentile believers that in order to be pure members, real, genuine members of God's family, they had to follow certain practices, certain rituals, including physical circumcision. And this group of people really for us represents anyone who says that we need something on top of putting our confidence in Jesus and his finished work. Look what Paul says about such people. He says, look out or watch out in verse 2. See it there? In fact, he says, look out three times. He goes on to say, they are wild like wild dogs in verse 2. And he calls them evildoers. What they're doing, he says, is wicked. It is evil. It's pretty blunt. Paul's not messing about, is he? He's not pulling his punches for a simple reason. Because your spiritual safety and mine and our joy depends on this. Depends on having our confidence put in the right place. So he says, number one. Number one factor that's going to help you to keep rejoicing this coming year and to help you and me stand firm, throw out self-confidence and rely exclusively on Christ. Now that's the, the longest point this morning, you'll be relieved to know. But there's a second thing. Secondly, Paul says, if you want to keep rejoicing and to keep standing firm, secondly, remember that nothing is greater than knowing Jesus Christ. Let's just drop back to verse 8. Read it with me, verse 8. Indeed, Paul says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Interesting language again, verse 8. I count everything as loss as lost. That word count, it's a deliberate, deliberate weighing up and valuing of everything in his life. What a striking statement that is in verse 8. Knowing Jesus, Paul says, when he's done all of his calculations, knowing Jesus is the greatest privilege in the universe. He says it surpasses everything else in life. Nothing else comes close. You can never exhaust the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. That's what Paul says. Now, I think we forget that very easily. At the moment, it is so easy, isn't it, amidst all the challenges, all the restrictions we're facing, so easy to focus on what we don't have and what we cannot do and what we can't enjoy, what we're missing out on. And if we're not careful, we start to miss the wonder of what we do have and what we do enjoy. A relationship with Jesus Christ that Paul says surpasses everything else. So having led us on a confidence check a moment ago, Paul is now inviting you and me to take a value check. Is my relationship with Jesus more valuable to me than anything else? When did I last weigh up the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus? When did I weigh that up against my job, my wealth, my possessions, my relationships, my reputation, my success, and so on? What is the thing that you prize most in this coming year? What, what do we most long for for our children in the coming year? Is it achievement? Is it qualifications? Is it relationships, a spouse, family? 
Paul is saying we will never rejoice in Christ as we should, we will never stand firm as we should, if we value anything or anyone more highly than we value Jesus. Because ultimately those other things will disappoint us and they will rob us of our joy and they will lead us away from Jesus. It's also worth noting here that Paul says he had suffered the loss of all things to gain Christ. In other words, Jesus was more important. Knowing him was more important than all those other things. What a challenge that is. I wonder what other pursuits have you and I had to abandon because they clash, because they get in the way of knowing and following Jesus. Have we paid any price in pursuing Jesus? Is knowing him worth sacrificing anything? One final way we can continue to rejoice this coming year and continue to stand firm, yes, throw out self-confidence and rely exclusively on Christ. Number two, remember that nothing is greater than knowing Jesus. Number three, we need to experience the resurrection power of Jesus. Firstly, in the present, right now, day to day. Let's pick it up, end of Verse 9, Paul says he wants to know this righteousness which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. The power of his resurrection. You know, the current list that Forbes has published of the most powerful people in the world runs like this. In third place is Donald Trump. In second place is Vladimir Putin. And in first place, it is Xi Jinping. There's a lot of power in that list. But all that impressive human power is nothing. It is absolutely nothing compared to the power displayed in the resurrection of Jesus. In Ephesians 1 and other of Paul's letters, Paul describes it there as incredibly great power. Power that conquered death itself. And Paul goes on to say that incredibly great power is at work in you and me if we are believers in Jesus. And that is the power, the resurrection power of Christ that Paul wants to know in his life day by day. And it is a wonderful thing, an awesome thing, that the moment we put our faith in Jesus, the Lord Jesus himself enters our life in his resurrection power through the Holy Spirit. We can know the power of his resurrection in our lives day to day. Well, why? What's the purpose of all that power in our lives? Is it so we can do dramatic things? Not particularly. No, Paul wanted that power so he might live the way that God was calling him to live. So he could follow Jesus day by day in all that that meant, all that that might look like for him. You know, there in verse 10, it would be much more comfortable, wouldn't it, if there was a full stop after that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. But the sentence continues and may share his sufferings. You see, Paul knew if he was to know Jesus deeply and fully, then he must follow Jesus on the road of suffering. He must share in the sufferings of Jesus, an element of the death of Jesus. So many of us, I guess all of us, are struggling at some level at the moment. Where do we find the strength we need to keep going, to keep trusting in Jesus, to stand firm for him and to keep rejoicing? Well, here's the answer. Paul says, in the resurrection power of Jesus. And I know for a fact that often I lose my joy and I become wobbly in my faith because I I stop relying on his strength and on his power that is at work in me. That's the secret, says Paul. Keep looking to Jesus. Keep leaning on him and depending on him. It's 
worth noting that um, in verse 10, when Paul says um, that I may share his sufferings, the sufferings of Christ, that word share is implying a, 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 a fellowship with Jesus as we suffer with him. It's implying really that we come to know Jesus even more deeply, most deeply, at those times. And of course, Paul's wish here in verse 10 is being at least partly fulfilled as he writes from a prison cell. Listen to what the famous preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon said about this. He said, I'm afraid that all the grace I have got in my comfortable and easy times and happy hours might almost lie on a penny. But the good that I have received from my sorrows and pains and griefs is almost incalculable. Suffering is the best bit of furniture in my house. And remembering that and knowing that, that it's part of God's plan that as we share in the Christ's sufferings that we come to know him more deeply, knowing that, it brings a deep joy. And it certainly helps us stand firm when those tough times come. Finally, final thought, knowing Jesus means sharing in the final resurrection. Yes, we know his resurrection power day to day, but one day we will share in the final resurrection. Verse 11. Verse 10, I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any possible means I may attain the resurrection from the dead by any possible means. The prospect of this resurrection in the future is so glorious to Paul. The prospect of our dead bodies being raised, that we will meet him in the air, that we will be transformed to be, to be like him, that suffering will cease, that these frail bodies will be clothed in immortality. That is the Christian hope. And whenever the Bible mentions it, the purpose is quite simple. It is to encourage us. It's to help us to keep rejoicing despite the pain of this present broken world and our present broken bodies. It's to encourage us, to help us to go on standing firm. It's been such a tough year, hasn't it? And there are tough months, maybe even tougher months ahead. But God is faithful. And here's a passage to encourage us and to remind us that he will help you and me to keep rejoicing. He will help us to keep standing firm as we throw out all self-confidence and we trust exclusively in Christ. Secondly, as we remember that there is nothing greater in this universe than knowing Jesus. And thirdly, as we experience and rely on his resurrection power. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for your word, which is rock solid reliable, relevant, and brings us such encouragement. Thank you for the gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you that in him we have everything that we truly need. Help us to treasure that which is truly worthwhile. Help us to keep trusting in the Lord Jesus. Help us to value knowing him, this extraordinary relationship you've enabled through the cross. Help us to value that above everything else in our lives. Help us to experience your resurrection power today and tomorrow and each day in the struggles that we experience as we wait and long for that final glorious resurrection day. Lord, help us, we pray in these difficult, challenging days, that we might continue to rejoice in you and that we might continue to stand firm for you and bring great glory to your name. Lord, we need your help.
we are weak. So we ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a closing song in our homes. And it's a song which has these beautiful words. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Great is thy faithfulness. God bless you.